Encerrando, então, o nosso, o nosso workshop desse ano, ah, agradeço ao Adriano a oportunidade, a gente sabe da agenda dele cada dia mais apertada. Então, obrigado, Adriano, por estar aqui com a gente. Ah, tenho tempo de uma hora para a tua exposição e depois a gente tem um espaço para as questões. Ok, thank you all here in, in the internet connection. Uh, I think very kindly for Eduardo who could organize the Kiron workshop this year. Um, it is the first one we organized almost entirely in the internet. So it's <laughs> a landmark for the Kiron group. We at the Kiron group, we work in naturalizing morality and Uh, in the past uh, few years, I've been trying to naturalize every, sing every single uh, character of morality. And so every time I add something to that uh, goal, which is uh, translate, to explain, to describe, to give an account, a reasonable account of morality, Uh, within nature. What I'm going to do today is uh, to add uh, one or two points to that uh, task. So I'll take the next hour trying to uh, showing something that for the students and for the audience here and uh, are well known, except by this one or two uh, addition. And since it will be recorded, it will be a nice uh, document for students and, and a bigger audience to see what we are doing here. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, one of the less challenges uh, I'm facing in naturalizing morality is values, to understand, better understand values. And when I gave the title to Eduardo, I was exactly uh, putting myself in the position to uh, make an effort to add something to that issue, how to naturalize, to understand values in terms of uh, uh, immanent terms, so to speak. So the title of my presentation is this, From Regularities to Values. I will, of course, then um, uh, try to explain values in terms of regularities, uh, regular, regular, <laughs> sorry, regularities. And in order to do that, I have to do something more. Okay, so this is the, the kind of introduction. The best way or The best way to, to, to characterize what I'm doing here is as meta philosophy. So I'm, I'm much more interested, I would say, in, um, in discuss the way philosophy discuss morality than to provide some data uh, or experimental data to that. Uh, to, to uh, cognitive interpretation, understanding of morality. So when I realized, when I think about what I'm, I've been doing, I've been struggling against a view of morality. In, I think this is part philosophy uh, and part meta-philosophy. So some meta-questions on moral philosophy. Uh, how empirical should moral philosophy, moral philosophy be? Uh, should we prefer to do armchair philosophy or lab philosophy? Listening to some of the presentations given in this uh, workshop, I would say that my presentations is the less experimental of all. I, uh, I won't give a single data, so I'm sorry, uh, I'm not uh, able to do that yet, 
but I'm part of the reasons is because I'm pretty much concerned to that matter task to criticize the way philosophy uh, usually think about morality. But I will uh, deal with some of the issues people brought to the discussion, uh, especially uh, Paulo Souza and Sofia. Sofia also uh, touched some interesting issues I would like. I, I will uh, bring here, I will comment here, and I think she will recognize those issues. Answering the questions, how empirical, uh, the question, how empirical should moral philosophy be? My answer is a lot. Uh, may sound paradoxical because I said I won't give data here, but I hope that by discussing the meta uh, philosophical questions, we can prepare philosophy to receive, to be better informed by empirical experiments. But also we should be able and we need to discuss uh, what the meaning of the experiments to philosophy and to moral philosophy. This is also a very important issue. Philosophy sometimes is, uh, not only sometimes, I would say, uh, at least among us in Brazil, are uh, uh, very reactive to the, to the empirical approach, to, especially to morality. So to say that it's a lot is to say something which needs an explanation. And we, of course, we, can, we have to ask why. <laughs> And the plain answer is that because we have a nature, we have a human nature. Uh, there have been lots of discussions in philosophy in, in uh, well, in the centuries before the 20th century, but also in the last years of the 20th century about uh, human nature. Actually, from the middle of the 20th century, I would say that the, not the middle, but the, at least the end of the, of the century, the concept of human nature have been uh, rehabilitating, uh, steady, uh, but not among philosophers. Philosophers are still very reactive to the idea of human nature. It seems that we are not free if we accept a human nature. So the concept of human nature is still problematic. But I think things are changing in this century. And uh, it's a very nice uh, opportunity that we have to tackle again uh, in, in the concept of human nature. And in order to uh, help us to make sense of this concept, I would like to bring uh, uh, quotation, uh, and I will give an interpretation of this quotation, which is uh, wh which favors uh, my nat naturalistic approach, but a quotation which belongs to someone who lived uh, more than 2,500, 400 years before us, which is Aristotle. So it's a nice to see. It's nice to see that uh, he was thinking in terms of nature. And it's not a scene that we can do that today as well. So uh, we can still follow Aristotle, be it nat nat naturalized morality, and we still follow Aristotle. And he says, if, uh, if then there is some end on the things we do, which we desire for its own sake, everything else being desired for the sake of this, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, for at that rate the process would go on to infinity, so that our desire would be empty and vain, clearly this must be the good and the chief good. And he follows, will not the knowledge of it, the chief good, have a great influence on life? Shall we not, like archers who have a mark to aim at, be more likely to hit upon what we should? If so, we must try 
in outline, uh, at least, to determine what is it, and of which of the science or capacities it is the object. It would seem to belong to the most authoritative art and that which is most truly the master art. And politics appears to be of this nature. Uh, of course, talking about end may seem something very abstract when we think about uh, naturalizing morality or naturalizing our aims. But it's not very far away. We can think about we as biological beings, and Aristotle, of course, had that in mind. He described uh, uh, humans uh, as rational beings, as a species. So uh, I think it's, it's easy to think that he was uh, he has something that we are by nature. We are something by nature and we aim by nature to some end. Okay. And he thinks that, uh, well, to discover what is that that we aim to when we are acting, when we are living in this world, would be excellent, would be great. And we can do that only by a science. And he thought the science would be politics. Okay, politics. But I think that uh, politics uh, seems to be the art of achieving the chief good. And here I, I, I dare to add something to Aristotle. After more than 2,000 years, I think we can allow us to do that. Um, politics is still the art of achieving the chief good. But it's... Uh, barely the art of discovering what is the chief good. Well, we can discuss that, but what we could and should add to Aristotle is that there is sciences of the chief good. The idea was to discover what we aim to when we act. And then we think that there must be an end or different ends we aim to when we are acting in this world, and that politics is the art to uh, organize us in order to facilitate our access to that end. The science to discover what end is that is the science about us, about human beings. So it's the science who can help us to understand what we are, what make us what we are, what make us humans what we are, make us uh, homo sapiens. And those sciences is much more developed today than ever in human history. So biology, psychology, cognitive science, social science, and like, you name it. There's lots of other sciences who can really help us to understand, to understand what we are. And now I could, uh, we should include in those um, sciences, the sciences, oh, and also these sciences can be based on that as well, sciences based on big data. Big data are so important to un understand what we are because by means of big data we can describe patterns that are very difficult to perceive, to, uh, to, to uh, uh, to be aware of without big data. We, have, we are so complex, our behavior are so complex, we need lots of data in a very long uh, span of time, and when we have that, we can give, we can have a better, much better account of what we are. So all of that are really, really helping us to understand better what we are. Actually, we know a little bit what we are, uh, but we need to fill the gaps, the enormous amount of gaps that are in our knowledge. We are animals. We are animals with a big brain. We are animals with a big social brain. We are animals with a big social and pregnative brain. And this is also very important. The way our brain basically functions is the way 
the brain of all other creatures with brains work. Our brain is an evolution of that, so it's, it's part of, of this evolutionary driven that uh, brought us here. And is, in a sense, a, a machine, and, uh, 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 an organ who predicts uh, and works with patterns, uh, with expectations. We here we have the uh, in our cognitive. How do we call it, Sophia? Yes, the cognition laboratory. Uh, Experimental philosophy in cognition studies lab, we have an EEG. An EEG machine is almost specialized in detecting expectations. Expectations generated by our, the ability we have to predict things, to make things known when they are not known by means of the regular, regular, regularities we are uh, expose it to. So, uh, we know a little bit what we are. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about experiments and uh, to what extent are they relevant to normative ethics. I have here this uh, problem uh, and you'll see in a moment why. Or you will, I will confirm why. Because uh, uh, to make experiments, the kind of experiments we are, we have been exposed to in philosophy, in, liter in the uh, experimental philosophy uh, literature, uh, give us some answers, but uh, they are challenging. They are challenged all the time. So uh, it's necessary to go a little bit. Uh, through that. And the problem is people don't think that experimental results can tell us what's right or wrong, although they can tell us how we arrive at our right or wrong judgment. Or what are our average moral judgments at a point? Uh, we've seen also this uh, along the workshop. Uh, lots of experiments who can tell us what is the average idea about some subject. Um, or at a point, the majority of the people in different countries, I saw a presentation yesterday, uh, think about that, like that, that and that. Okay, so that kind of experiment give us a better understanding of the way we think about, we actually think about uh, different aspects of reality, including social reality. Okay, no problem. But the thing is, does they help us to understand better uh, what we should do, uh, or just give an account of what we actually do? Experiments have revealed the base upon which we build our moral reactions, but the dispositions revealed are value neutral and therefore somehow irrelevant to the normative task of normativity of morality. Value neutral in the sense that, as I said, they depicted depicted the actual situation. We at this point think in different regions or the majority, uh, we think about that and that issue uh, following that and that pattern, but we cannot say from that that this is good or bad. <clears throat> okay, but let's stress a little bit the premises of the criticism. Are they value neutral? Uh, are those experiments uh, neutral in comparison to the results they present and the values they, uh, they investigate? In a sense, if we consider parochial or conventional and, and 
Souza brought this, this the distinction conventional and universal. I thought it was uh, interesting, and I add this to this presentation because of his uh, presentation. I was using parochial, but conventional is a good uh, idea to describe what parochial could be. So if we consider parochial or conventional values, the answer would be obviously, obviously negative. Of course, in a sense, it is uh, the, 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 the experiments are neutral against values of some kind, but they are made to identify conventional bias or, or our, uh, to identify, uh, Yes, bias in conventional values. So they are not neutral to conventional values in the sense that uh, they bring to our attention what the dominant conventional values are. But they are still neutral in the sense that knowing what the conventions are are not the same as knowing if the conventions are right we should follow the conventions, if it's okay that we have that and that convention. But philosophers, as I said so in this, in this slide, the philosophers are interested in universal values, in values independent of desires, emotions, and preferences. And our universal values, uh, sorry, and uh, something missing here. And are those experiments neutral in relation to universal values? Yes, usually they are. As I said, knowing, and we'll see two examples uh, in what is, is coming. When we see the results of those experiments, we receive no response to the questions. Well, okay, the conventional values are those. Now we know people like more X than Y. But is that all right? Is that what we should prefer? Or knowing that, we should better change people and change people, those desires and, and bias in order to improve uh, what they have to, to do. As Sophia mentioned in, in, in her presentation and, and answered negatively, uh, good philosophy give us an account of the universal principles we should follow in order to act right. Okay. Uh, she's skeptical about that. I am skeptical too, but it is uh, also a sign that in connection with experimental experiments in morality, they are neutral in terms of universal values. They, they, they cannot uh, tell us if they are right or wrong. Okay, but let's stress this premise as well. The premise that there is uh, universal values. What an, uh, an abyss had us as is an universal value. What the kind of, of animal is this, the uh, universal value? Uh, we could add to an answer something like that. On objective values, desire, uh, desires independent values, emotions independent values, preferences independent values, which means values exactly independent to our, what would count as our nature, or would, as would count as part of, or a consequence of what we are. So it's interesting, it's a kind of uh, splitting things, splitting what uh, we are in terms of biological beings which act and react in this world, from our moral beings to which we would demand that we should act in a specific way independent of what we are. 
So this picture is, is, is disturbing, is dominant. Um, so again, Sophia pointed to this uh, problem as well, discussing about emotions. Uh, and of course, one of the big uh, changes in the recent years was uh, how neuroscience and cognitive science has shown uh, that emotions are important. And we cannot understand what we are without emotions. Not that the philosophers in the past uh, weren't aware of the importance of emotions, but exactly because they were aware, they said values, universal values, values should be independent of that. Uh, uh, Kant's theory of action is a very good example. Uh, he, he have tried to uh, handle the problem of how could we act upon principles considering that we are sensitive beings. So it was a big problem. And it was related with uh, what kind of emotions we need to explain our actions in terms of rational principles we uh, we are we can be aware of so they were aware of the problem but they were also convinced that uh, our actions should and must be or, or, uh, oriented by universal values objective values okay thing is that uh, considering everything we know about what we are and the world we are in, which means that we can only explain what we are and uh, the way we act in terms of what is in this world in an imminent way. So it's very difficult, the idea that we could act upon something which is, uh, which does not belong to the nature is very strange is uh, it should press us philosophers to change our mind in relation to the idea of universal values so there is no point to make a theory of action a theory of explaining how we act without considering the causal chain connected, uh, co connecting the whatever, intuition, idea, um, the stimulus passing from one point, passing through our brain and acting upon our muscles uh, and or say, which means uh, we, we have to explain all our actions in terms of is giving in this world only. So could we have reasons to act that are entirely independent of our desires, emotions, or preferences? Uh, would make sense to make a theory of action which, is, which rejects, which says that, well, a good action is an action that would be performed without the intervenience of desires, emotions, or preferences. That would be like explaining what we are in terms of what we are not. We are sentient beings, we are beings of desires, we are animals, so we are everything I said we are. On the other side, can we describe human nature without descri describing human values? Uh, and the answer is, of course not. In every single human culture, there are values. So values are part of what we are. We cannot uh, set aside values and describe uh, humans without considering that we handle with values, that our behavior is oriented by values 
you know, the, the va values are part of our, the way we organize ourselves. So a, a good description of, of the human society of humans must include values. And which points out, which press us to think that either we understand better what we uh, or philosophers are uh, hoping for when they are talking about universal values, uh, or we are in a paradox. We, we sh then we should be pressed to explain something. We need to explain something to just, which is, of course, obviously part of every human society, uh, in terms which are not compatible with the science we know, the science we have. And, uh, of, and here is the, uh, uh, the key move into uh, naturalizing morality, is to describe and or to define, to accept values as bias. And, and that's it. So it's to give up the idea that there, there are universal values in the sense I presented before. <clears throat> there is a burden, of course, in doing this. And the burden is um, relativism. And and this is something like uh, 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 which, are, which terrify philosophers. If we give up the idea of universal values and we keep, uh, we hold, hold on to the idea that values are bias to act, which is compatible with the science we know, we are, uh, kind of lose in a world without objectivity in morality. And we are lost in relativism. We should then accept everything. We should, uh, we could not blame or praise anyone anymore, and so on and so forth. So the consequences uh, would be grave. I'm not convinced of that. I don't think the consequences are grave. The consequences are exaggerated, but they are not groundless. The concerns are not groundless. Of course, philosophers are right uh, in demanding for some objectivity. Because it's also part of a good description of values and a good description of morality to say that morality cannot depend upon the mere desire of the subject. Because it's obviously a non sequitur to uh, start from this definition and uh, concluding that if this is right, then everything everyone do is right, and we cannot uh, complain anymore. This is not feasible. There is no society who could survive with that. So part of what we do while living together is to demand from each other uh, behavior and uh, the compliance to, to principles which are or should be independent to what we want in that moment. So this kind of control depend upon uh, pressing toward some objectivity. So although I think the, the, the consequences are exaggerated, 
the concerns are well grounded and we have to give an account of that. <clears throat> and now the question is, and if they are so biased, can we discover natural universal bias to actions and choices? This is not the same discussion as moral realism. Very important at this point. I'm not saying here that we should look for moral facts that could uh, legitimate our moral judgments. Legitimate in the sense that that could make our moral judgments uh, true. And therefore, give them the authority upon our actions. The question here is descriptive and is, is, is part of this, uh, the naturalistic, naturalistic approach. Uh, considering that every society has values, is organized, has a morality, is organized in terms of this uh, mutual uh, demand for behavior control, could we find a trait or traits that are universals? Could we find ways to think about that? Could we find uh, bias, natural bias to our behavior, which could count as moral values? So this is the idea. Could we find that? <clears throat> okay. Uh, on more experiments, let's uh, go through very fast um, because I will give two examples to show the limits of the experiments in dealing with the question I have just uh, proposed. So I'm, I'm giving this from Pizarro. Uh, not only does the momentary or experience of disgust, uh, he is famous for his experiments on how disgust can influence, determine our, influence our uh, political judgment. Not only does the momentary experience of disgust shift judgments in a politically conservative direction, individuals who are more readily disgusted reflect this on the, in their stable moral and political attitudes. That tell us what can influence our judgment, not that they are right or wrong. And then we have a, a totally different kind of experiments, the thought experiments. Uh, and the thought experiments uh, was, they, they were made in order to check our a priori uh, intuitions about morality. So let's do thought experiments. And clever guys turn them into uh, uh, actual experiments. Let's try this and let's uh, see what real people do when confronted to that kind of um, situation. And what we can learn from them. And it's interesting. Green uh, says, many philosophers regard scientific research as irrelevant to their work because science deals with what is the case, whereas ethics deal, deals with what ought to be. Some ethicists question, the questions, question this is ought distinction arguing that science and normative ethics are continuous and that ethics might someday be regarded as a natural social science. That might be something that I was proposing here, something like that. Uh, no, I'm not proposing this. I agree with traditional ethicists that there is a sharp and crucial distinction between the ease of science and the art of ethics. I talk, I, I've talked about that uh, uh, so far. But maintaining nonetheless that science, and neuroscience in particular, can have profound 
ethical implications by providing us with information that will prompt us to reevaluate our moral values and our conceptions of morality. In fact, many of the um, people who work in experimental philosophy, they, they do that hoping that they can find uh, hints of how to improve the way we judge things. Uh, what, what should we do in order to judge better, and which means avoid mistakes, like the way we do when we uh, try to discover what makes us make uh, mistakes when we are adding, we are doing maths. If we learn how to follow some rules, if we had a method like Descartes uh, to better uh, think, to think better, that would be great. We could then enhance our moral life. At the background of that is the idea that there is some universal values, there is some universal principles we should follow. Uh, Green is himself uh, skeptical about that. Casbier, for example, examines recent work in neuroscientific moral psychology and finds that actual moral decision making looks more like what Aristotle recommends and less like what Kant and Mill recommend. This is interesting. Those philosophers, they uh, were not concerned with understanding uh, the cognitive process behind our moral judgments. Nevertheless, of course, they had some idea on that. Uh, their work uh, contributed somehow, uh, uh, need as a premise to have some ideas about the way we actually think about and make uh, decisions and act. From this, uh, he concludes, uh, Kasbier, that uh, available neuroscientific evidence counts against the moral theories of Kant and Mill, and in favor of Aristotle. This strikes me, me as a non sequitur. How do we go from this is how we think to this is how we ought to think? So interesting, um, uh, saying that Aristotle and, sorry, Kant and Mill, uh, the way Kant and Mill think that we th make decisions is less accurate than our science can, uh, can say today, is to say, it's, it's not to say that they are wrong about, about what? About the principles they are defending. Of course they are wrong about the theory of action they are defending. Uh, for that, uh, uh, concerning that issue, of course they are wrong. And if Aristotle is more coherent with the, what we know about humans today, the theory of action, Aristotle's theory, theory of actions is much better. But the problem again is, wow, this, is, this says, says nothing about the principles they are defending. The way this is said is confusing because now we are, uh, the, the distinction I'm, I'm, I'm making here is not the distinction he does. So at certain point, we, we don't know what he is talking about. He's talking about uh, Kant's theory of uh, uh, what is good, Kant's theory of value, uh, Kant, uh, or can we compare that with Aristotle's theory that we act toward being happy? Uh, what is that? So it's confusing, but there is something in the background, and this something in the background seems to me is, uh, that is the idea that there are universal principles, we should find these universal principles, and uh, he also, Green, is interested in improve the way we act. Discovering, describing what we do is a way to improve 
uh, the way we act actually improve uh, to improve the principles we should act upon. And my point is, uh, I also is skeptical about the idea that we can find using science the universal principles uh, Kant has in mind, or philosophers in general has in mind. We cannot, I'm also skeptical, we won't find that because not because of the values in itself, but because of the theory of action we should uh, defend the theory of action, an, an immanent, a naturalized theory of action. Considering the way we act, it it's make no sense, as I said, to consider that there are universal principles which does not belong to this world. So, let's put this aside. Considering values as bias and uh, regula regularities, now we can make this question. Experiments can discover regula regularities, but can they reveal non-parochial values? We know that experiments can discover regularities. We know that. But what about values now? And there is here a tension between a priori truth or a priori values and regularities. Regularities, as I said, seems to be less uh, <clears throat> we, we should be less confident in regularities than uh, in a priori values when we are, when we intend to act right, when we intend to act uh, to do some good. <clears throat> well, I will now explore, and this is something I'm adding here. I will explore the idea that uh, it's the opposition is not that big. As I said before, the concern about having some kind, some objectivity in moral values are well grounded. The consequences of not having universal values are exaggerated. So the middle ground would be regularities are not generate, uh, sorry, uh, regularities generate patterns and patterns are biased to actions and decisions, therefore, values. And what about the universality of values? What about what philosophers expect to be a priori value, values? Well, regularities are not generate randomly. They have to respect a rule of success. In the sense that dysfunctional choices have less chance to become patterns. So, although regularities are far from universal bias, regularities are not randomly produced in humans. Uh, and here, of course, the, the, uh, the direction uh, is what gives us the, the, uh, the north to think is the theory of evolution. Not every change is accepted in an ecosystem. It's only the functional change, the functional, the, the, the change that give uh, or gives some advantage to the, uh, to the beings, to the bio biological beings. So although it's evolution is a blind process, in the sense that it's not planned, planned by anyone, it is not blind in the result, it's not uh, by chance, it not happens only by chance. There is chance and there is also controlled information 
and controlled result. You, the, the, only the result which is sustainable is reproduced. So in this sense, it's not chaotic. It's not a chaos. Very important. So we have here middle ground. Regularities are not universal, but they are not randomly. They are not by chance. They are not invented by, I don't know who or what. They have to respect the rule of success. They have to feed uh, some ecosystem. Functional here mean, meaning functional for human, human cooperation. And now we have an additional explanation to what we've, uh, an additional element to the explanation we are looking for. Regularities in terms of morality, they have to be functional, and they have to be functional to something which is very, very important for humans, uh, considering the way we evolved uh, uh, so far, which is cooperation, human cooperation. Functional to respond to the human socioecology, as described by uh, Sheck, uh, Karo van Sheck. Uh, we are cooperative, we, we are cooperative breeding. We all we 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 breed cooperatively. Uh, we are cooperative gathering. We gather things cooperatively, and we hunt cooperatively. That was the social um, ecology we our species evolved in, and we are the result of that. And of course, lots and lots of regularities became fixed bias in our behavior. And if we could discover the fixed bias in our behavior that brought us here, we could find what are the determinant, what, what are uh, important for us to consider as good or as bad in order to maintain our socioecology or our uh, human environment functional. So that, that's the idea. And um, I think now I have a, uh, made the, 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 the explanation more consequent. We have collective mind. Uh, there is no social life without morality in the sense that a functional, uh, uh, without a functional system of behavior control. We need that. And because we need that, and this is what we could call morality. And in order for that to function, we have to have the means to make it function, to react to each other's demands, to, uh, uh, to prefer certain things instead of others, not universally, not necessarily, that's forgot, uh, forget the, the, the modality here, but uh, without that, we would fail. And indeed, lots and lots and lots of uh, species failed. We are the single one who made up to the uh, point we arrived. So uh, failure, it's not a problem in nature. It's a mean to uh, uh, to fitness. Okay, uh, let's talk about values, discourses on values. And now I, I, I would like to make also uh, a distinction I haven't made before. We have parochial values, values are called the uh, conventional. Non-parochial values Values we would like, uh, and I will explain in very short each of them, and the dynamics of values. Parochial, parochial values, let's see, uh, let's uh, explain them by saying that uh, we demand for, for some. So they are conventional, and conventionals, con conventions, sorry, conventions are less the scopus of convention are less broad 
than non-parochial, the scopus of non-parochial values. So parochial values we demand for some. Non-parochial values we demand for everyone. We can uh, uh, name some examples. Parochial values is uh, you shouldn't eat uh, pork or you shouldn't eat meat uh, next Friday. Next Friday is uh, a Catholic holiday. You shouldn't eat meat. Depend on the way you see, you describe, depend on the society you are, that would be a uh, parochial value or a non-parochial value if everyone is, uh, should be concerned on that. In our society in Brazil, now we are tolerant to people who eat meat on uh, Passion Friday, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, uh, this label here is not fixed, it's depend on. It's a uh, uh, um, sociology, sociolo uh, anthropologists can describe in different ways, depend on the society. But there is something underneath that which we should look upon, which is to the dynamics of values. Uh, it's the, uh, I'm not sure about the term, but the idea is there is something underneath the way conventions or parochial and non-parochial values works in society, which is determined by fixed dynamics. And perhaps now that we are looking for the universal part of values, we should not look for values in itself, like parochial or non-parochial values, but rather to the dynamics, the way, uh, the, the, the necessary conditions for values to work. And, uh, and value, the, kind of values we humans need to survive. And in this view that uh, we can talk about uh, symmetry, uh, from symmetry to universalism and egalitarianism. Universalism and egalitarianism are two very important values in Western society. Big values, big things, uh, and somehow competing values. There is a struggle. Shall we be more universalist or more egalitarianist? egalitarianist? But interestingly, we, we can look uh, to those values, uh, dynamics of values, and not as values in itself. They are too abstract, perhaps, to be values. We could, should consider them part of the dynamic of values. And it goes like that. Let's uh, understand universalism in this sense. If it applies to me, then it must apply to you as well. So our tendency to, uh, uh, to, to demand for everyone the uh, behavior or the principle we are following. So it, 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 if, if it, it applies to me, then it must apply to you as well. And when it, uh, it does not happen, what happens to us, we are indignant against the person. So, and this is a very good sign, the emotional reaction is a very good sign that we have moralized the, the topic. And we, when we moralize the topic to everyone, so we are talking about non-parochial uh, values. We are talking about values that we demand for everyone. And the uh, sentiment underneath this demand is the indignation. So indignation, it's, uh, and this is uh, Tugendhat's uh, uh, contribution. Indignation is the sentiment behind the universal, um, uh, universalist tendency we have. Good. The other example, if, it be, if I belong to your moral community, then I feel guilty if it applied to you and not for me. The other side of that is uh, that I, if someone demands something from me, uh, for me, or to me, then I must have the adequate tool to react properly to that demand. 
And this, here there is an asymmetry between indignation and the, sen the sentiment behind this reaction, which is guilty, guilt. I don't feel guilt about everything. Uh, I feel guilt if I share, I feel guilt, guilt uh, towards you if I share with you reasons to feel ashamed about that, uh, which means if I somehow belong to the community, moral community you are in, if I understand myself a part of this community, if you are indignant towards me and I do not recognize you as part of my moral community, I am indifferent to that um, uh, sentiment. So there is an as interesting asymmetry. Um, this is not uh, Tugendhat, this is my addition to uh, Tugendhat's contrib contribution about moral sentiment. Okay, but in both, in both, in universalism and in egalitarianism, what we are fi uh, finding here is some taste for symmetry. Uh, although they are different in scope, when I am indignant, I'm indignant to everyone, but symmetrically, everyone should respect what I want. On the other side, uh, when I'm thinking about egalitarianism, I'm respecting only those who belong to my moral community, but symmetrically to everyone belongs to my moral community. The asymmetry is uh, only in terms of uh, my belonging to uh, moral communities. And here, of course, we should say that uh, we all belong to different moral communities, but the idea of belonging to a humankind moral community is a very vague idea connected with the idea that we have some principles which are independent to what we are and the moral communities we have. So I'm in the middle ground. There is reason to uh, demand for some objectivity, but not that kind of obje ob objectivity. The movement here is uh, the, the dynamics of moral demandings. Uh, what is in art but not in the subjective will is the will that we want, that everyone wants, should want, because I demand you to want what I want. It is this will and not only this which has the moral quality. I'm finishing now. This is what allows us to move from the fatic subjective level, I want, I desire, plainly this, to the normative level, I want everyone to want, we ought to. Even when the everyone is the everyone belonging to my moral community. So the dynamics works for parochial and non-parochial values. Uh, uh, saying again that the distinction is not a fixed one. The merely facti, uh, facti, uh, fantic, sorry, description of wanting does not include the commitment of moral will with the will of the parties concerned, which is precisely the sphere of normative want. Interestingly, uh, we can describe at least two very famous um, universal laws of morality in terms of this symmetry. One is the golden rule and, uh, and symmetry. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The idea of symmetry. And the other one is the categorical imperative. Act, uh, only according to the maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. Uh, this is only to say that uh, the, the, the idea of symmetry, uh, also there have been, uh, well, it was Sophia who asked uh, Paulo about the concept of justice and balance and imbalance, and they've talked about the balance and imbalance. Of course, this is part of the concept of justice. You can find, we can find this, the kind of description in Aristotle, we can find that in, in Hume. So morality has, uh, we have many examples of how symmetry, kind of balance, is connected with morality. And now we can understand why, we can understand because this is what is fundamental for the kind of life 
we humans need to live, which is a social life, a common life, a cooperation life. And without those preferences, we could not held a group sustainable. And without the sustainability of the group, the species would fail. So the, that, the, that preferences have been uh, developed and, or, uh, and, and selected in the history is not a mystery. And now we can find, but with some distinctions, we can find what we were looking for, that kind of objectivity. But our objectivity connected with what we are, with our human nature. So to the final remarks, what about universal values? We do not start from zero. We are not looking for some absolute principles. We look for principles that suit us, that suit humans, not gods or other animals, not even other rational animals. We start from our nature, from the human nature, and from the communities we live in. And that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Adriano. Well, uh, Paranius made uh, the following observation. It took some time for the concept of symmetry to show up, but there it is. Sorry? <laughs> Paranius Sorry? writes, uh, took some time for the concept of symmetry to show up, but there it is. It took me, uh, yeah, this presentation was also uh, um, uh, tried to answer questions that the, my group of students have uh, made to me in the last course we, we had together. So, uh, keep trying to explain symmetry. So, if it helps, so I'm, I'm glad. Well, um well, but, but there is another concept that appears uh, in your presentation that is, is a novelty, I think. Uh, there is the concept of bias. Uh, and, uh, and you describe values are just bias. Uh, and in that case, I, I remember that that, that concept works uh, in the, the theories of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, they have theories about what is a bias in the psychological and psychological process. And they think that bias are um, process from the system, the system one, automatic and non-deliberative uh, non process, okay? And well, in the end, you uh, try to, you try to, to, to characterize two uh, emotions, guilty and um, indignation, as uh, signs to, 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 to values. Huh? Well, uh, I was wondering if you are disposed to assume that uh, bias are uh, what Kahneman think they are. Uh, exactly process from system one. And your moral psychology will be like uh, uh, emotivist or things like that. Is, is my lecture, is, is my uh, observation correct or? Yes, up to a point you are right, of course. Uh, if I translate my position into metaethics, considering uh, moral judgments, I am an emotivist, this. That, that, of course. Uh, but saying that, it's not answer the whole problem of, of morality, and it's not answer uh, your question. Uh, saying that I am a motivist towards moral judgments, it's more like having a kind of uh, theory of, of judgment, so 
kind of philosophy of language, a theory of language toward moral judgments. But that kind of approach has also the difficulty that it cannot answer what is right or wrong. <laughs> so we are the same. So okay, I've I, I worked with that, and uh, uh, because I came from philosophy of language, in town, I would say with no hesitation, I am an emotivist toward moral judgment. But the problem remains: what is the? Uh, how can we find what to do and what not to do? So in that sense, the the sentiments are not signs; uh, they are not pointing to. They are the basis of. Yes, the way we act. Without emotions, as Sophia said, we cannot not act. So there are the, we need emotional basis. And now we are talking, what I'm talking about is the dynamics around these sentiments which can uh, make our moral behavior more understandable, more clear. And that's when a bias come in. So bias, I would agree up to a point as well, that a part of this system one. So it's not deliberative, deliberative. But we have to add to the theory the evolutionary part. It's not del deliberative and was selected. So we are not... Uh, <clears throat> we are not in control of that, those bias. We, of course, it doesn't mean we will always choose right, but it's like bias is. There is this kind of orientation in our preferences uh, to select among good and bad things. Good things uh, are things that you know, help Cooperation is in favor of cooperation. Uh, create a balance, and bad things are different. Uh, people would say, I can give an example that uh, uh, a society who thinks exactly the opposite. No problem. No problem. We don't, if we look only uh, a moment or a short period in history, we will not see the evolutionary path. And here is another element in this conception which must must be considered in, which is the, uh, the time, how much time we need to look at this. So if we are to build a good theory of values in terms of what values are um, preferred at certain period of time or for the majority of time, we should look at history. We should look a long period of time. But now if we are looking for what I'm looking for, for dynamics, we could look, not only humans, we could look, we can look to mammals and see how groups are sustainable, what they have to prefer in order to be sustainable. So there is lots of things in our human nature which help us to maintain what we are. And without uh, the need or, or um, and we don't have to take this into account in order to make decisions. They are really biased. They, they orient uh, our choices. Well, okay. So we have a question from, from the chat, from uh, Honey. And the, the question is, well, when morality is naturalized, what does it mean that moral values are grounded uh, in instincts? In this sense, animals have notions of values that right and wrong? Uh, if so, morality would not be human exclusivity and would not arise with of the society. No. I lost grounded in? Sorry. Um, oh, I repeat. Um, in this sense, animals have notions of values uh, yes. uh, of right and wrong. If so, morality would not be human exclusivity and would not arise uh, within society. Okay. 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely. They have, they clearly have notions of right and wrong, because not all all animals, of course. Uh, Animals like mammals who live in groups, they need to react to that kind of behavior control. So they really have some idea, clues of what is right and wrong. There is some right doing among dogs, among cats, among, and there is wrong doings, and they are punished, and they are praised, and so on. So, so of course, completely. It doesn't mean that are the same <laughs> values as we have, yeah? because we are different. We have different needs, uh, and we have, uh, by some of them are, might be the same. And the dynamic, and this is the important part, the dynamic is probably the same, because we inherited this dynamic, the same dynamic, punishment. Punishment is a kind of expression of indignant, uh, ind uh, indignation. And they, they, they must feel some kind, some, some uh, uh, repression when they are uh, not praised, when they are criticized, when they are punished. So, yes, yes, by all means. I don't agree with your uh, imperative, almost Kantian <laughs> search for principles and reasons. I don't agree with that. But it's almost as men search for principles. I think maybe men have another, a different <laughs> brain, a moral different <laughs> brain than women. <laughs> Don't you think so? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. But children are moral. And children very early already have moral sentiments, moral emotions. They help. They, they get angry. And they don't deliberate as we do. And they haven't learned social principles in a rational way. So I really don't think that we must learn universal principles so as to be moral. I don't think so. To learn universal to learn principles. universal principles so as to be moral beings or moral humans. No. Uh, you didn't say that? No, you are asking me if, if we have to learn yeah, universal I'm saying principles. Yeah, I'm saying I don't think so, but you are saying we need them. No, 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 I haven't said that. I, I, what I said is, of course, on the basis of what we are and what we need, of course, we, are, we also, in our uh, cultural environment, we learn some rules which are not natural rules in the sense, are rules of our uh, society, rules of our community. Uh, we need them. We need them because we need to coordinate, but those rules are not universal. So the problem is to characterize those rules as universal rules. So there are no universal rules in the sense that are absolutely necessary for everyone, for every society in every time. No, there is only rules uh, adequate uh, which fit some environment, some social environment. But uh, the bias behind those rules cannot be um, uh, we, we cannot uh, leave set them aside they are also important we develop the rules we develop in the communities are rules we add 
to the bias we already have in kids and uh, can show them very early. Some sort of kind of preferences, preferences connected with needs, with psychological needs, with, this is a very human approach, uh, connected with pain and with pleasure as well. So it's, it's very, very biological in this sense. But aren't these bias, uh, I forgot. Yes, yes. I, but I, aren't these bias what we need to distinguish? And uh, they are the criteria to distinguish good moral norms from bad moral norms, aren't they? Yes, I agree, in the sense that without those bias, we would be lost, we wouldn't know what is good or bad. Because not, there is no good or, ba good or bad in itself. It, it doesn't make sense for me to say this is good or bad in itself. Uh, like it's uh, in the same way that is, it makes no sense to say that there is a, uh, a bean which is better than the other. It makes sense to say it is more adapted than the other. Adaptation here is a very important concept and is a loose concept, but not a chaotic concept. It's, you can, we can do a lot with adaptation. It, it depends, but now, more important, now that we are what we are, that we have had this, uh, the evolution we have had, we are kind of stuck in what we are. So kind of condemned to like certain things. It can change, yes, it can change, as everything in biology in, in can change, uh, but not uh, uh, without a great effort and a huge pressure to select another uh, different bias. Because the bias we have, they give us an advantage. That's why they are, uh, we prefer this because they give the, this preference give us an advantage. Well, uh, considering that uh, we are recording uh, this conversation, I, I need to to make a, a indication for you about the, the notion of value. Well, uh, and and after that, I will. Um, demand a footnote in your book about values in the future about this that I tell you now. Uh, David Lewis offers uh, the following definition of value. value. I quote, hopefully values are what we are disposed to value. Less hopefully, we have this schematic, schematic definition. Something of the appropriate category is a value if and only if we would be disposed under ideal conditions to value. And after that, he says, uh, he says, first, this definition is a naturalistic definition. It advances an analytic definition of value. It is naturalistic in another sense, too. It fits into a naturalistic metaphysics. Well, this definition <laughs> works for you. Yes. <laughs> I, Thank I, you so I, much. I will expect the footnote yes. in the future. You won, you won the, the quotation. <laughs> well, I think we're done. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, Adriano. Yeah. And thank you everyone who has seen us and all the other uh, speakers in this workshop. And thank you very much, Eduardo and uh, Diego. Diego. Diego, who is also making everything possible here in terms of our connection. Thank you.